we are live now on youtube so uh, if there is anyone who can't join us here please always remember that there's a youtube option Okay, so today we want to continue um, looking at uh, what we started in our last class. Uh, that's on OOP. Okay, so I will share my screen. Um, sorry, guys, for those of you that have not added to any group, the reason is I somehow feel it might be counterproductive to do that since we are already at this point. Okay. Um, very soon we'll be transitioning to Avenue's tracks. And once we leave, when we get into Avenue's tracks, we'll be much more engaging there. So if it's for the re if the reason you do not do your assignments is because you do not belong to any group, when we start our tracks, I would um, clear out some things with you so that I will know so that it will not affect your grading. Right. So we we'll, we'll discuss that. I've not forgotten any of those things. I tried sorting it out somehow this morning, but it just somehow skipped my memory but we are going to definitely do something about it okay so uh, like i was saying what we are going to try and resolve today is um the outstanding concepts we are yet to learn on java OOP. okay so uh, there's something we need to know uh, in our last class we started uh, looking at uh, encapsulation. Now, also beyond the encapsulation, we also looked at um, uh, inheritance. And so there are two or three other key concepts that we need to look at, and then we can, uh, to a reasonable extent, say that we have learned uh, Java. Okay. So, but. Um, not exhaustively though we are going to see these things exhaustively when we uh, go into our various tracks like i mentioned to us if you see the case of the inheritance there are certain things that i deliberately skipped and so that they don't confuse us now it's okay for us to understand it at that basic level so that as we begin to come into the various use case scenarios we can actually see what they are used for and that way it can make more sense to us right so it not be that you are memorizing things right rather than understanding a natural use case pops up and we make use of that concept then uh, it will be much more clearer to you okay so we looked at um, classes that day uh, considered the various members of the class I am correct. Okay, so we uh, did some kind of review and we said that uh, methods and variables are the key members of the class. And beyond that, we also mentioned another important member of the class, depending on what that class is to be used for. And we said that uh, would be a constructor. And we said we could have multiple constructors in a class, a constructor is essentially used to uh, give an object a certain default value when you're creating it. Okay, so we are going to see as we proceed today, we are going to see the powerful use of constructors when we are looking at the scanner class. Okay, we'll see uh, how constructors can make a scanner different. 
constructor is essentially that thing that can make your class. Uh, you create a class and it behaves this way for this person. You create that same class and it behaves this other way for another person uh, because of the constructor choose. Okay, so these are essential things we are going to, we've already learned, but we are going to all continue to see more of them as we move on. Okay? And uh, today we want to uh, push that knowledge further uh, by moving from that encapsulation inheritance to see what more we can do. Right? To see much more that we can do with the OOP concept. And the next concept we want to look at today would be the concept of uh, polymorphism. Polymorphism. And uh, for most of us, we must have heard about this concept theoretically, right? Poly there means many. Morph there means a form, right? Like when you say metamorphose, metamorphose means to change your form. And so when you say polymorphism, it means something that has various forms, like many forms. Okay, poly there means multiple or many, right? And the, uh, the morph there is a form. So polymorphism is essentially talking about something having various forms, right? And as long as Java OOP is concerned, uh, usually um, polymorphism doesn't just happen accidentally. Polymorphism is something you create. You deliberately bring it into, into play. And how do people bring it into play? They bring polymorphism into play when they make use of inheritance. If you don't inherit, then polymorphism cannot come into play. Now, a what you would call polymorphism would not be polymorphism because remember I told you about method overloading. Method overloading would be when you have a method that has the same name but different signatures, different method signatures. That is method overloading, right? And it's totally different from Polymorphism. Right? Polymorphism is essentially uh, you could have uh, the method signature would be the same. The method signature would be the same, but the methods are doing different things. Let me take that again. Method overloading uh, entails that the method signatures will be different. even though the method names are the same. But with polymorphism, you will have these method names, they are the same, but the contents of the methods are different. Like what the methods are doing are totally different. And so that is what we mean by having multiple forms. And we need to get this thing very, very clear so that we don't mix up this concept. Now, people can easily mistake method of alluding to mean uh, polymorphism. They are not the same thing, right? Okay, so, but we are going to look at it today. So, uh, the other day we were looking at our animal class, I believe. We we're looking at our animal class. And so, this was a very uh, simple example that we we're looking at that. And uh, with the animal class, uh, we created a goat class. And what that goat class only did was to extend that animal class. Now, but look at a very typical case where polymorphism can come into play. Now, if you look at the animal class, and let's say for some reason, when you created this animal class, like this makes sound. Not all animals make the same kind of sound, okay? Uh, some animals may uh, bark, some others would. Like a parrot, parrots essentially mimic human voices, okay? So uh, every animal would definitely have a way of producing sound. So you can see that even though they, we expect it to return sound, and that the method then will make sound. But what happens inside the method itself cannot be the same. Because we don't expect all animals to make the same sound. 
So because we don't expect all animals to make the same sound, essentially the logic you're going to have inside this method will differ. And so that is what we mean by polymorphism. But how do we then achieve polymorphism? How we achieve it is that we come in here and say we want to override. In fact, let, let's, let me put it this way, right? If you're using NetBeans, if you're using NetBeans, you can right click and say insert code. And let me show you the shortcut. You can right click and say insert code. And then you say you want to do the override method. Are we following this? Yes, sir. Okay, so it will ask us which method do you want to override from the animal class. The reason it is specific asking you which method you want to override is because you use the keyword extends animal. So NetBeans has gone ahead to look at your animal class and find out the methods you implemented there. So in this case, we want to override the make sound method. And so we are going to click on generate. So as you can see, what happened was that it simply generated this beautiful code for us. Now, it simply generated this beautiful code for us. Right, from here, we can begin to do a lot of things. So what we can do here is that we can come in here and implement logic that is unique. We can come in here and implement logic that is unique to this particular subclass. And this subclass here is the goods. So this is where we implement the sound that will be doing meh, meh, meh. Right, because we are what we are doing here is that we are overriding the super class. We are overriding the make sound method in the super class. What we are saying is, please keep whatever you have. I know exactly how I want to make my sound. That's what good is saying to animal. Keep whatever you have inside your method. I know exactly how to make my sounds. Let me do that myself. And so this is the concept of polymorphism. That's where you have. Uh, all or all methods having uh, you have the same methods but in various classes behaving differently behaving differently or they have the same method signature the same method signature the same method signature so that is the key thing here to highlight but with method overloading that is happening within the same class okay and you're you're having different method signatures but the same method name that's method overloading but what we are seeing here is that we have the same method signature but we are now having different contents okay so i believe that concept of polymorphism is clear or is there anybody that has any kind of confusion about it I didn't understand though. What did, didn't you understand? Can you be more specific? Sandy so talked me out when you were explaining. So I didn't really get anything from it. And that is where you should have started from. You should have started by saying, Oh, I lost connectivity at some point. So I didn't get everything you were saying and saying you don't understand. Hmm? So okay. before before I respond to that, is there someone who was listening to us that didn't really understand? If I do a recap, so that you ask me something specific. Okay, so let's do a quick recap. Let's do a quick recap. Now, see what I have been trying to explain. I said that polymorphism is a concept in OOP that allows us to have behaviors or methods or have our logic, have a certain block of logic that represents something eh, implemented differently. What does that mean? If you look at this animal class we created in the last class, we all agreed that we should have a method that does, that is called make sound. 
The reason we agreed on this method is because we know that all animals make certain kind of sounds. But what we did not implement that day is that not all animals, these animals, in fact, all animals rarely make similar sounds, except when you come to the case of a parrot trying to mimic a human voice. But when you listen to a parrot critically, you would also realize that there's a distinction, okay, between what a parrot does and the actual human voice, okay? If you listen critically, you're going to see those distinctive notes that a parrot produces. But that's not what we are uh, considering here. What we are saying here is that there are certain cases, because remember that the, one of the major advantages of OOP is that we can reuse certain code. And we decided to create this animal class where we have everything that is common about animals so that as we go into our good class, we wouldn't need to type too much code. Remember when we went into OOP, that we created the goods and we were able to use the features from animal to do our goods implementation. Why? Because every good has a, a skin color just like every other animal. So, but this skin color implementation, we had it in animal and not in goods. Look at goods, goods is empty, no attributes here. Right? So the, the advantages that uh, OOP presents is that you can have reusable code components. That's the idea, that's one of the major advantages. And one way to be able to re reuse code, right? To have code you can reuse is by inheritance. And so that inheritance, essentially what it means is that you create a base class or what you know as a super class and then build other classes from that base class. Like we have animal here, right? We now build another class on top of animal by saying public class goods, which extends animal. So what this essentially means is that this goods is inheriting everything from this animal class. So that goods is all of those things in the animal class, plus these additional things I started typing inside goods. And that is why if wherever we are now using goods, it can give you the functionalities that animal has and the additional functionalities it has in its own class. But that is basic inheritance. We are now saying, to explain what polymorphism is, we are now saying that polymorphism can only happen, polymorphism can only happen if you've had inheritance, if you've inherited, if you've had classes, if you've had classes that are bound to each other, by inheritance, okay? If there are a group of classes, so imagine that with this animal class, I had my goat class, I had my cow class, I had my snake class, okay? And all of the cow, goat, and snake, we are inheriting from animal. You see that these four classes are bound by inheritance. Uh, these other three are subclasses of animal. So what we are saying is that whenever you have this kind of arrangements, if you're actually doing the right thing, then there is bound to be polymorphism. What does polymorphism mean? It means that the, you have a behavior, a method in the base class that does not really sit well with the subclass or the class you built on top of that class. And so what you now do in this case is instead of throwing out that method entirely and creating an entirely new method that has a different name in the subclass, all you need to do is to make that particular method have a different form. And what we mean by different form does not mean in the name of the method or the method signature. Having a different form is essentially the code, the logic that makes up that method. And so we said that for you to do that in your subclass, for you to be able to uh, make use of the polymorphism, the concept of polymorphism in your subclass, that there is one annotation that is very, very important. Very, very important. And that is the override annotation. In fact, if I open up uh, some mobile apps I have here, right? 
you're going to see this concept everywhere. You see where this guy was. Ah, Inter override something. Okay, yes. You see where this guy is overriding uh, this on options item, right? You see, this, uh, this is a very typical example. It's overriding something here, right? So this is, uh, the, this is an important annotation in Muslim. We are going to see other annotations, particularly for those of you in mobile app and backend, you're going to see learn about a lot of annotations, particularly for those of you in backend when we start doing uh, frameworks, okay? You're going to see a lot of, there, there will be heavy usage of annotations, right? Okay, so but the important thing here is, that we are introducing this annotation known as override. This override is what helps you to override the whatever it was that was implemented in that base class for that particular behavior. So let's assume that in your animal class, that the base behavior, the base behavior we implemented was that every animal should be doing meh, meh, meh. Now, probably because we were what we had in mind when we we're creating this animal was to create a good class first but because we have now created decided to create let's say another class called um, chicken because we have decided to create another class called chicken we now realize that this chicken cannot be doing meh, meh, meh that we implemented in make sound, the base animal behavior. That's the make sound, the basic make sound behavior that we had in the animal class. We cannot make use of it because what we had in mind when we we're creating that was for the goat class. And inside the goat, the goat is not overriding it. But now that we have chicken, chicken cannot be doing meh. Chicken will be doing kokoroko, right? And so for us to still make use of that make sound class inside chicken what we are now going to carefully do is to let's quickly let me quickly extend animal right so what we can now do here so what we can now do here to make this look, uh, capture what we are saying is that we just right click, Nate Beans has this already. That's why I don't want us to type it manually. So just right click here and say insert code. What kind of code do you want to insert? I want to insert an override method, right? And the override I want to do is on the make sound method of the animal class. So I'll click on generate. So it will now override it for me. And I'm saying in here, this is where you can now put what makes this make sound for chicken to be doing kokoroko, kokoroko, whenever it is called. Because let me give you a very quick example, hmm? right? In here, I can say something like system, system dot out dot Then let me say kokoro ko. So that's what chicken does. So that's what chicken does in make sound. And but what we had implemented inside animal was that this guy would do. What this guy will do is to say, uh, man. All right, so now let's go to our OOP main, main class. And then uh, for the goods, 
and then we'll also do something for the chicken we'll create chicken okay so um we are going to cause two of them to make sound All right, so let's let's run this. Let's run this. Um, suspecting something, but let's run it first and see what we have. So let's do a regular clean and build. Then I will run our OOP. Okay, so my suspicion was right. Okay. So if you look at this, you realize that, uh, look at the OOP here, you notice that we created goat and created chicken. And so in line 18, we asked the goat to make a sound. And afterwards, we asked the chicken to make a sound. So if you look at the output we have here, when the goat made a sound, this is what came out. So when the chicken made a sound, this is what came out. And you see clearly that this guy had this, right? While goat, goat, look at goat, though. look at goat carefully. Goat does not have any make sound method, right? Because remember, like I said, it inherited its make sound directly from animal and since the make sound in animal satisfies the behavior of goats goats did not need to override it or create another form of make sound but chicken wasn't satisfied with that kind of sound that was implemented in the animal class so the chicken had to override make sound from animal in order to create its own custom make sound behavior i hope we understand what we are explaining okay only one person understood yes sir all right so um now that is essentially polymorphism and it's it's very useful you cannot take away these things right the the key concept here is that there's a class you're trying to uh, make use of its features. Take for instance, when you begin to build advanced things, uh, let's say you're building a desktop application and you see the color class that uh, Java has and you like the things it has, but there are certain things you're not very comfortable with it. You feel that there are certain things you can do better. So you don't need to go and reinvent the entire view all you need to do is to extend that class, right? 
and then override some of the functionalities that we implemented there to have your own functionality. So that way, the time it would have taken you to create your own custom color class from the beginning, from scratch, would be reduced. So instead of creating everything from scratch, you adapt that class to suit your needs. Adaptation. You adapt that class to suit your need. And that is what polymorphism is all about. You adapt the class to suit your need. And so uh, we, so far with the OOP concept we've explained, we've explained encapsulation. And we said encapsulation is very important when you want to secure your data. Remember that we said that every software you're building at this point would be made up of your data and logic. Your data and logic. Your data and logic. Every software you build at this point. Okay? And so we mentioned to you that if you wanted your data to be more secure, then you don't want uh, other parts of the application to just be able to assess your data anyhow, maybe because some, of some uh, policy of government, right? You're working in a team and it's your responsibility to implement uh, your, let's say, data privacy uh, stuff or to implement some level of security for data. And because you're working in a team, you don't trust the other person to deal with the data the way you deal with it. So what you will do is that you're going to use the concept of encapsulation and secure this data so that before anybody has access to this data, you'd have run some kind of checks before you grant the access to this data. We showed those examples when we talked about encapsulation. And the next thing we moved on to was inheritance. And today we have talked about polymorphism and we've explained and shown you that polymorphism can only happen if inheritance has already happened. Right? If inheritance has not happened, polymorphism will not happen. Right? Please bear that in mind. Bear that in mind. Okay? And so the next concept we are going to talk about uh, would be this concept of um, abstraction. Right? Uh, this concept of abstraction, uh, that is uh, the next concept we want to discuss. Okay, and so for some programmers, uh, this part is uh, the part that usually blows their mind. Like the once they get to this part of OOP, they run away, right? They'll be comfortable with the encapsulation, they'll be comfortable with uh, inheritance, they'll be comfortable with polymorphism. But the moment you talk about abstraction, they believe is too abstract, they just chicken out. And so I'll try to use uh, layman terms, right? to be able to communicate the idea behind, behind abstraction, okay? Now, the things I would say, you may not find it in any textbook online or any material online. I'll be speaking to you out of experience to help communicate the concept of abstraction, okay? But before we go into that, I would like um, Pascal Mary, uh, and then Chisomo Donsi to tell us what they already know about abstraction. So, Pascal Mary, go first. Okay, sir. Um, what I know of abstraction is the programmer hiding complex code from the user. That's what. Okay, must it be complex code? I know. I don't think it must be complex code. Okay. Okay. Um, yeah. Chisum, uh, how far? Do you have a contrary view? Okay. Chisum has bailed on us. All right. So, but we can continue. Yeah. Pascal, you're very correct with uh, your explanation. But look at it this way. No, sir, I didn't build on you. My network is disturbing. I'm still here. Okay, so what do you understand by the... What, what do you know about abstraction? Okay, sir. Um, abstraction, like Pascal said, is simply um, concealing 
implementation details of particular functionalities in code. So, for, for instance, Java um, implements abstraction in certain classes like the dot length property of um, string, or sorry, dot, yeah, dot length property of strings. Now, uh, we don't know how it's actually working under the hood. So, abstraction is like it's taking away the complex logic or unwanted logic from the person that is using it, something like that. All right, uh, thank you very much. So, uh, both of you have actually captured the entire explanation. So, but something that will help you remember these concepts quickly. Encapsulation helps you secure data. Abstraction helps you secure logic. Let me say that again. Encapsulation helps you secure data. Abstraction helps you secure logic. Now, uh, there is another use for abstraction, but we're going to see it shortly. In fact, a lot of developers, what they, they have tilted, what they have turned abstraction into, in fact, for, there, is, there is an IT environment you're going to go into, and you will discover that what they are using abstraction for is totally not about uh, obscuring logic. They are not using it to obscure logic. What they are essentially doing is that they use it as uh, they, okay. We are going to get there. Let's just let's just take an example. And they, there are there are there are multiple approaches to implementing abstraction, but I will teach you only one. The reason I will teach you only one is that one is effective, very effective, very effective. I will explain why it's very effective, right? Because if you already know how to uh, extend another class, then you wouldn't need to start. Okay, now there are two approaches. Let me just mention those two key approaches so that I'll now choose one and tell you I'm choosing that one. You can imp implement abstraction by using abstract classes or by using interfaces. Now, but there's this principle about inheritance. You cannot inherit from more than one class. So if you're inheriting from an animal, you can only inherit from an animal. So it makes no sense to now limit, make use of abstract classes in, in kind of obscuring your code because anybody that will want to make use of that uh, abstract class, if the person is inheriting from somewhere else, the person cannot inherit from you. So it is better when you're make, doing abstraction that you stick to interfaces. This is what experience has taught me. Stick to interfaces when you're implementing abstraction. And so we are going to see a very quick example here. Okay, so um, I will create uh, another one. I will call this, uh, let me, okay, let me call this, Let's try an, another class so that we use this to explain the concept of abstraction. So let me create a class. I'll call it math calc. Mm -hmm. So a uh, math calculator. Now, if I wanted to make this an abstract class, all I'll need to do is to remove uh, to add abstract to this class here, right? If I wanted to implement this abstraction by using an abstract class, but like I said, like I said, stick to interfaces. There's almost, the, in fact, the key difference between uh, an abstract class and an interface is that with an abstract class, you can have methods that have logic inside it, right? For interfaces, all your methods don't have logic. Everything is totally obscured. But that's the key difference. And so they, they, there is no need to begin to sacrifice the benefits that interfaces can give you because you want to have one method that implements logic. No, except you have weighed all the options around you and you must do an abstract class. 
then you can do and so that's why i'm not going to explain it in this class we are not going to use it as an example we are going to go ahead and use interfaces so that it will register in your subconscious that what you use for implementing abstraction would be interfaces so if the need ever arises that you have to make use of an abstract class believe me the moment you look at the definition of abstract class on any material online you see there is no difference with an interface you can actually implement that as well so all i can do is to either change this keyword class to interface or if i don't want to do that i can delete this file now one other thing i, re I remember teaching you about refactor the other day right um i if there are two ways to delete a file in your project either to delete it from the refactor option which means you want to safely delete it so what this does is that if there are other classes that were using it it will warn you ahead of time so that you don't delete what other uh, files are relying on to perform their functions but if you want to just delete it you don't care about the consequences just click on this guy and go your way right so let us right click on this and then say new then we'll see java interface we click on it and then type that we want to create a math calc interface and then we say finish it for us and so if you look here you would notice that the difference between this guy and the former one is just this keyword here interface so if i remove this keyword interface here and put class i've gone back to a class so that's just the difference okay uh, because remember that we told us that the basic unit of almost everything we do in java is a class and so this is where we begin to have distinctions right because interfaces are not the things that they don't actually run your code in fact the the life of your code the soul the spirit of your code are in your classes the interface it only helps you okay fine. let me let me let me explain one other use case for interfaces so that we understand what i was about to explain so if you look at an interface uh let's say let me use uh, what should i use here let me use uh, let me say double away no bubble double integer add then this guy is expecting okay he's expecting a double as well a double called a comma a double called b now based on our knowledge of classes if we're creating this as a method the next thing we should have done at this point is to open a bring in a pair of curly brackets or braces right to bring in a pair of curly brackets here so that we can flesh out our method but with interfaces what you are going to do at this point is to say semicolon Something is wrong. 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 What kind of identifier? Guys, one minute. Let me look at this guy critically. Something is wrong there. could be wrong here double a double b
This is very strange. Guys, please, just a minute. Let me let me understand what is going on here. I can't honestly understand what is going on here. Oh God, what am I doing? No, uh, nobody even pointed this out to me. See the see the mess we are doing. We said double and integer, and I thought as much. Ah, oh God, it's not supposed to be so. We wanted the double. Oh God. So guys, um, you know what we are supposed to do here is to put the return type, but we cannot have two return types in the in the method signature. That's that's totally totally wrong. And I've been staring at it, and it wasn't looking as if uh, there was a mistake there. And that was a terrible terrible error. Okay, so and you know that is why sometimes the error message you get may not point you in the right direction because it was saying. It is expecting an identifier. And it, it wasn't just making sense. It wasn't just making sense. Because the identifier for this method signature here would be this method name. And it was already there. So, okay, I, I now see. I see what is happening. This uh, add here, it was treating it as an identifier for the int. But it was not seeing an identifier for the double. And so that is why that error <coughs> came up. Okay. Right, so, but this is what we do essentially when we are creating um, interfaces. Now, if you look at this, we've created, what we're supposed to do here was to create a method that when you uh, submit uh, two double numbers to it, it will add it up and return a double number, right, as a result. But in this case, look at what we did. The implementation is not there. And so that is what uh, Pascal and Chisum explained by saying that, you're obscuring uh, the, the implementation of this method from the user. Now, but there's something else I would like us to, uh, that there's another dimension which I've seen most people. In fact, there's the, the last bank I, I worked on their stuff, that was the mentality there. The mentality, they were not using interfaces for uh, obscuring code. They were using interfaces as a contract. Let me explain that. What essentially they were doing is when, when before they give you a task, right? What they will do is that they will create an interface so that you know eh, that what they expect you to do is to flesh out this method what they want you to do is to create implementation for this subtract and for this add right and so this is usually useful if maybe the back end team they are far behind on what they are doing and then or let's say the people on the phone transfer they are slow and the people that are doing uh, let's say account transactions eh, or balance are faster but they need something from the fund transfer guys but because the fund transfer guys are slow what they can do is that they will create this interface showing them exactly the kind of data they, they, they should be expecting to get back if they call this method and also showing them the kind of information they are expecting from them when they are calling this method so all they need to do is to create this as a contract specification send it to them and then this is what they will use from their own side in order to make use of math calc so that on my own terms 
I can now go ahead and implement math, math calc. And I'll make sure I follow the same contract here. And how do I do that? How do I do that? It is not hard. So let us uh, create another class here and call it, let's say just Java class, call it uh, calculator. Now, this is the actual calculator. Remember, I said that your interface is not alive. It's just something that, uh, like, I would say those guys are using it. It's just something that, like, guides you, tells you what to expect, but it doesn't show you the code, right? So for, for you to have the actual implementation, it must be inside the class, right? So the class is where the life is. The life is not in the interface. Okay, so always bear that in mind. The life is not in the interface. By the way, these things I'm deleting like this, you can actually delete them once and for all by uh, configuring your uh, templates. So if you come to templates, you're going to see um, a whole lot of options. Uh, take, for instance, under Java, you're going to see uh, your Java class, what should show, right? Uh, so you say, open in editor. So this is what will show, right? If you're creating a new Java class, so you can modify this template to allow you, so that whenever you're creating a new Java class, it might be empty, okay? So you can change these settings from that template uh, that I just showed you. Okay, so now that we have this, what we are going to do in this at this place to make use of this interface we just created is to simply say, implement math calc. Remember that if you're inheriting, you use extend. If, you're, if you want to make use of an interface, you use the keyword implement. Now, what this forces you to do is that the moment you say you're implementing this interface, it will now force you under most to override all the methods in the interface. Because if you don't override the method, you cannot implement it. Eh? Look at what these methods are here. They are very empty. There is no implementation. But if you remember in the case of inheritance, we have implementations, right? The code, the methods here, they have a body. Okay? And so which means they were implemented. And that is why when uh, we inher uh, when we inherit we are not forced to override what we inherited we can use what we inherited like that but when you're implementing an interface you must override everything why because they don't have bodies there's no logic was implemented in it so that way in fact name beans will prompt you to do that and you see this error coming up just click on this balloon icon and say implement all abstract methods so you see that the moment i click on that it will automatically generate something for me so here in here this is where i can now do all my implementations in here and in here i can do all my implementations here to do my addition do my subtraction are we following yes sir So the assumption is that everybody is following because nobody said no, sir. Okay. I like how silent everywhere is today. That's usually that's usually the norm, but uh, it's, it's it's an improvement. It's good. Okay. So this is um, what uh, it means to do abstraction, right? Here, we can have all the logic we want to have inside this method, but over here, there is no logic. And so for some, they use it to obscure code, while others use it as something to specify standard specification. Like they use it to set a standard that must be followed. Eh? And you see this a lot in the professional sectors where they don't, in fact, eh, now, when you become, a project manager of some sort of software uh, projects 
um, and because and they, that's why the best project managers or software projects are, are heavy programmers. So what they do is that whatever they want their team to work on, they create interfaces for all of them. So what they drop would be that interfaces. So you just download the project and what you are seeing are all interfaces. So you already know what to do. You pick up the interfaces that concern you and you start fleshing them out, right? And some people, what they do is that they later abandon those interfaces, remove them entirely from their project because what they were trying to achieve was that they were using that as a standard while others will also go ahead and continue to use those interfaces, right? In order to obscure code from users. So I've mentioned two use cases. People use it to set standard, to ensure that ensure compliance from whoever is going to do the full implementation. People also use it to obscure their code, right? Because if you're looking at this thing here, right? And it is this interface you're allowed to interact with. You wouldn't know how they did their add. You don't know how they did their subtract. So all you know is that if you want to add, just call this add and pass in two doubles and you get your answer. Right? So uh, because of the multiple, the number of things we want to cover today, we are going to leave this explanation here, except someone has a question to ask. Uh, the actual use case would come in, hopefully, in your assignments, okay? Uh, the last assignment you're doing in Java, and I carefully, I want to carefully make sure that I cover all the essential things today so that I can relax and give you any project I want to give you, like proper projects, like proper assignment. And this proper project is what uh, you guys will defend uh, when you come in from next week, okay? So I'll give you a proper project to go and work on. So because the, the assumption is that after this class, you have covered Java. Because every key thing in Java, I would have mentioned it by today. So every other thing you will need to learn, you just need to, it's just an extension of what you already know. There's nothing, nothing too complex to learn on top of what you already know. It's just an extension of what you've already learned, right? So I'll be giving you um, a project to work on. And so you've had rest from the previous class. You did not do any assignments. So that rest, I believe, should be enough. So all the energy you reserved, you put it into uh, the next project. Uh, the, that's the, I'm calling it a project deliberately because it's not going to be an assignment that's trying to test you on one area, maybe just array, or maybe a loop or conditional statements. No, it should be a project where you're expected to um, make use of almost everything we've taught you so far, right? Uh, and even more, the, the idea is even more, because remember, I explained something to us. Take for instance, if you wanted to achieve uh, capital letters with Java, it is easy, okay? With, the, with things you already have in Java, it's easy to achieve that. All you need to do is to say, Take for instance, if I create, uh, if I come inside this method here and say string uh, boy equal to equal to let's say okay, okay. Now. I can make this okay, okay appear as caps lock by saying boy dot to, to uppercase. Now, I can make it to uppercase, I can make it to lowercase, but what if I want to do Pascal case? What if I want to do snake case? What if I want to do camel case? These things are not here. <clears throat> In the default, the, this Java API, this string API, right? So all I need to do is to find out online, is there a library that does this? If there's a library that does it, I will simply download that library and plug it in. And today you are going to see how we can make use of libraries, external libraries to achieve what we want, okay? And so that's why we are not going to spend too much time on this, right? The idea is that we've covered the basics. So if there are things you want to achieve that 
we are not specifically or explicitly mentioned during the course of the training, then you're going to source information online and then help yourself, okay? Right? So you can also consult me um, if I am not too tied to something, I will quickly, quickly respond, quickly, quickly respond. So but if I'm tied to something, I may not look at my WhatsApp, and not that I don't want to respond, but I may not have time to look at WhatsApp. And by the time I'll be looking at my WhatsApp, uh, maybe the question would have been should have been too late to respond to your question. Okay. But if I'm looking at WhatsApp and you have a question, then it's very likely I would attend to it. Okay, but that's not the concern here. The concern is I want to learn uh, something else so that we can cover uh, Java today. And now, something else that I want to mention is this concept of threads. You know, thread, like uh, this thread tailors use now to make clothes. Like that's that spelling of thread. Okay. In Java, it means something different. In programming, generally, it means something different. Uh, you must have heard of concurrency, uh, the concept of concurrency or parallel computing it's is what drives those things right uh, look at let me let me see if i can find something here that will aid on our understanding let me see the tax manager okay then let's look at okay yeah processes is there right okay now look at what is happening here uh, look at what is happening here. if you look at google chrome google chrome has about nine processes currently running but it does not mean that you have nine different google software installed on your system what is simply happening here is that there are various threads handling each of these like all of these things are Google tabs. Each tab, a thread is dedicated to process one tab. Another thread is dedicated to process another tab. Like that, like that, like that, like that. So this this is what is known as like you the, the ability for your software to be able to handle many things concurrently at the same time. Right? Because the natural way of software is behaving is that when they take on one task, they focus on that task and just finish with it, right? But what if at that same time that's working on that task, you want it to do something else? Now, imagine imagine the bank, okay? Um, if banks, their software were to be built to handle one person's request at a time, then you know there will be a very big problem you can be rest assured if i tell you that there are banks in nigeria today that are dealing with about ten thousand requests every minute the other day i heard uber uber they do twelve thousand rights per minute or yeah is it per minute or per second right even if it's per minute eh twelve thousand rights per minute is heavy because if you want to trickle it down you discover that you're doing uh 1000 rights every five seconds and if you bring it down to seconds you will discover that for every second you're doing about 40 rights now imagine 40 people trying to send in a request every second to the same software not a different software the same software trying to process 40 requests at a time and this same software will be able to handle all of these requests simultaneously. Now, what makes this possible is the concept of threading. And so there are cases where you would need to be able to create your own threads, to, to create a thread to say, please manage this in a thread. Now, how many of us have noticed that if you're using Access Bank, they do it, they do threading a lot. Like 
I can assure you, Access Bank does, they do trading a lot, right? They are, they are software developers are good. They are good with, they are good with managing threats, okay? I've seen their USSD application and I give them kudos. They, they, they are very good with it, okay? Now, if you have used Access Bank USSD application before, you'd notice that when you do transfer, it will immediately send you a message and say, your transfer is processing, even if it could not push the request immediately. So what it does is that, okay, in fact, the whole thing is on concurrency, right? So what it does is that it will push your request. And if your request, because uh, USSD sessions, the timeout is 20 seconds. If after five seconds it checks and there's no feedback on that your transaction request, it will send you a default response and say something like, your transaction is processing. Please do not initiate this request again, something like that. Or we are, we've received your request, we are dealing with it. Or it will just tell you successful. Sometimes it will tell you successful, you wait and wait and wait, you will not see any uh, alerts. The person will call you, have not received anything, you check your balance, your money is still there. Right? So the reason they sent you that initial feedback is so that you come down and wait. So what essentially happened there is that the thread that received that request is the thread that responded to you. But they now pushed the bulk of processing your request into a new thread. And that new thread will now be working in the background to handle that request. And so I will show you uh, how these things can be done, right? So that uh, you would understand what we are saying. So we are going to do something uh, very quickly here. So let's uh, create, fact, let's go, fact, let's, let's create something else. Uh, since this was on OOP, let's create another project. Um, guys, are you following me so far? Am I just talking to myself? I'm following you, sir. All right. Um, so see what, let's have a very practical example. Okay, so that we see what it means to thread. Now, there are other concepts that might look as if we have not touched, but if you look at it, like if you follow that W3 school syllables, you might think there are certain things you have not touched, but if you look at it very well, they are similar to some things we've already talked about. And since we have a very limited time, we have to skip those ones that we have already somehow touched, right? So that we go into concepts that will require me to explain for you to maybe make sense out of it. Because threading, for instance, can be very tricky. Very, very tricky. Very, very tricky. Okay, so it's important that we uh, understand how to deal with these things. Okay, so now let me say, the moment you uh, run this application, so let's say the first thing you need to do is to say, uh, hello. Let's get him to say hello. So the first thing he will say is, hello. Okay, so the first thing we are getting it to say is to say hello, right? And so, um, uh, I want to do something else here, okay? I want to do something else here. So I'll say, let me create a thread. Let me create a thread. Now, just creating this thread here is meaningless to you right it's totally meaningless to you um a thread cannot function on their own until you trigger them and how you trigger a thread you trigger a thread by saying thread dots start 
and so that thread will start running okay so there's something i want us to learn so um with this i can now say system dot out dot print line okay say something like bye bye now this bye bye is the assumption here is that you're done communicating with this person right the, when you meet people the first thing you say is you say hello right when you're done talking to them you now say bye bye right so but watch what will happen here okay so based on um, what we know about uh, flow control which we've discussed in one of our previous classes we have sequential execution we have a selection which is conditional statements and then we have iteration which is where we bring in loops okay so this thing is supposed to do this one will run okay this one will run right before this one will run so the idea is that this thread is supposed to run first because the way programming works is that if this one is not done executing the next one cannot be executed and that is why if you look at all of these uh, projects we've done that use the scanner class as long as that user has not typed in something and that scanner captured it that program will post there nothing will happen because it was following a sequential execution order uh, flow of control and so the idea here is that if this guy is not done executing then this guy cannot be executed right and so that's the idea here but there's a little difference because we are now introducing threads okay we are now introducing threads and so if you want to go back to that uh, flow of control one other thing that will change it from the major three to having four ways of doing a uh, control flow will be to introduce concurrency but there are certain things we'll not be talking about at the basic level but at least you know now that another way to control the flow of your logic is by bringing in concurrency right but those are not the things you're going to discuss when you're talking about flow of control okay these are not the things you talk about when you're talking about flow of control right but let us see what these are thread do now every thread eh, has um it you you have you have two ways in fact there are multiple ways of creating threads some people will create a thread by extending the thread class this thread class we are using here some people will create their own thread by just extending it while others will create their own thread by uh, there's an interface that has a runnable right but, but when you're familiar with interfaces very well we can look at that uh, particularly when we go into mobile app development we're going to see you cannot avoid um, making use of interfaces to do your threads in fact that's the default method there anyway okay uh, when we are uh, talking about mobile apps that's the very default method there if you're doing uh, android native development right that's the uh, default method there but those are various approaches we, are, we want to use this approach right okay so you cannot a thread must have a runnable it, it must have a method that when you say start it will go and trigger that method and you have to override it and so and there's something I'm going to do here. So if you want, you can do the same thing. And essentially what we are doing is that we want to override the run method of the thread. We want to override the run method of the thread. But because I'm using this approach, okay, wait, let me even show you what I mean. Uh, if I can, let me see. Let me go to W3 school. So I'll show you the other approach that people use. Um, yeah, threads. Okay, so see what I mean here. Now, if you extended this class, you would have to override. Don't mind what W3 school is typing here. If you type it like this, some, some IDs will generate error. You have to override it. You have to add that at override annotation. You have to override it please don't just copy this and paste directly like that it's in some ideas it might throw up errors for you even though in some 
it will only run with a warning. Who is talking? Sorry, sir. Sorry, sir. Um, I have a question, sir. Uh, who is that? So it's Victor. I, I have a question. Go ahead. Um, so you said some ID is a true error because of the because there's no override in that yes. um distance. Yes. So some. I thought you only use override for like interfaces. No, 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 no. We talked about in a polymorphism earlier, right? Were you yes, there when we talked about polymorphism? And I told you that the right way to do polymorphism, if you come into this chicken class, we over what we did here was override. And this is clearly inheritance. Okay, but we are doing polymorphism, we have to override. And when you're extending a thread, what you're essentially doing is that you want to ha have another form of its run method. And that is why you need to override. Do you follow what I'm saying? Okay, sir. Yes, sir. Thank you, sir. Yes. Yeah. So now what we're essentially doing here is that we are we want to adapt this run method to suit our own need. So you would need to override this. Some IDs will run run this thing for you, but with just a warning, while some will, will say, no, 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 no way. That's not a proper way to write code, right? Another way is runnable. Remember I told you, this runnable, we are going to see it when we get to uh, mobile apps and then backend, right? But let me show you threading proper, okay? Um, this approach is uh, very useful. So now what we can do is that in NetBeans, once you do control space bar, it will show you the various things you can do. So the first one there is actually a lambda expression, right? It's actually a lambda expression. And I've told you that lambda expressions are like shorthands of doing things, okay? So the reason I chose this, and I showed you how to do it, you just do inside that parenthesis, you do control space bar, it to suggest those options you pick that first one that is lambda expression right so if you want to know more about lambda expressions for now i would recommend you read it up from here okay but if you want to wait and learn fully later in class physically then you can also wait okay you can also wait and learn physically with us okay but in the meantime we don't want to talk about lambda expressions i just want to make use of it here so that you see actually what it is doing but you don't need to memorize uh how to type you don't need to memorize this parenthesis this arrow you don't need to memorize it just do control space bar inside the the new thread okay let me let me do that again So just come in inside this parenthesis. You see where my cursor is blinking now? Then press Control space bar. Control space bar is when you're typing something and you want NetBeans to help you out. Suggest very uh, possible values that could be there. Then it will suggest and then you use what you want to use. In my own case, I decided to do um, Lambda. Now, inside this place here, this code block, Remember, we, we learned that wherever you see a pair of braces like this, that what it means is that you should put a code inside it. This is what marks a code block, a code block. So wherever you see a pair of braces like this, right? Even in your normal code, right? You can decide to uh, mark out this. In fact, you can use this to do scoping remember when we talked about variable scopes and all that you can use this to do scoping right wherever you see a block of uh curly brackets like this it means that it should hold code for you right so but let's go back in here and then begin to do some things what i'm going to do here is that i'm going to ask this thread to sleep i'll ask this thread to sleep for let's say uh five seconds five seconds will be five thousand milliseconds 
So ask this trade to sleep for 5,000 milliseconds. So if you're doing something like this, it will force you to uh, protect against possible errors. And that's by using the try and catch. I promise you guys that we are going to look into try and catch. And so by the time I, I'm done explaining threats here, yeah, I'll come back and talk about the try and catch. So you know how we use it to handle errors. Okay. How we use this to handle errors, right? So all possible errors where you are you're thinking that there might be error. Okay. You can use it to handle that now right so here we are saying please this thread go to sleep remember please bear in mind that this application itself the app the program you're building itself is already running on a single thread so by creating a new thread and starting it creating a new thread does not start a new thread it is when you actually start it that a new thread will be created for you in the memory. So just typing out thread this that, that, that does not do anything until when you start it, that's when a thread is actually created. Now, some people will use, okay, wait, let me not confuse you. Let's just leave it here. So thread does start is what actually creates the thread. And that is when the thread starts running. So what I want us to realize is that naturally you will expect that if it does hello the next thing it will do let me also copy this hello the next thing it will do would be to print this hello right and the next thing and then it will first wait for five seconds it will print this hello it will uh, after printing this hello since there's nothing else to do inside this thread it will come out and print bye bye but let us see what happens. Let us run Threader and see what happens. Something is wrong. It was supposed to print the hello again. Uh, then let's clean and build our guy. Okay, okay, I see what happened there. I see what happened there. Okay, I'll explain that shortly. I'll explain that shortly. Can you see what is happening there now? Guys, did we see that? Yes, sir. Okay, let me run it again so that you see what happened. So it will print hello and then jump and print bye bye. But if you look at this place, oh, let me run it again. Or better still, let me go back to Threader and increase this to 10 seconds. So remember, the first instruction we have here is hello. The next one we have is sleep, but that doesn't print anything. The next one we have is another hello. So if we're going based on sequ uh, sequential execution, we should have it prints hello, hello, then before bye-bye. But watch what will happen, right? Ordinarily, it should have printed hello, then wait for five, uh, 10 seconds, print that other hello before printing bye-bye. But it printed hello and bye-bye. Why? Because another thread was created to run this hello so that thread is running as an application on, the, on its own, right? But inside this application. So you, you essentially created uh, something to run in the background while this other guy is running. So what is, we essentially did here was to say, guy, please take, up, take this thing up, run it in the background for me while I continue doing other things I was doing. So in your uh, access bank application, what you would have uh, said, said here would have been something like your transaction is processing. So what would have said here is your transaction is processing. Okay. And then, 
Okay, yeah. Hello. Then assuming maybe we got a feed, it got the feedback from us. Then the next thing to tell us is your transaction is processing. Oh, we're still doing that. Bye bye. Let me clean and build. All right, so let us run the guy again. So see exactly what happens. The moment you send in your request to Access Bank, they don't wait. They, they tell you your transaction is processing as a response. Then they go in the background, process your transaction, and then send you an alert, right? And tell you that social and so amount has been debited from your account. But in order for that USSD session not to time out and you feel that your transaction did not go, they will quickly send you this message so that you come down and then push your main transaction into a new thread and that will be handling it in the background. Do we understand what I just explained? Yes, yes sir. Okay, so that's the concept of threading and it's a very powerful concept. In fact, as we go into um, our various tracks for particularly those in backend, mobile app, even front end guys, you're going to begin to see other kinds of concurrency uh, approaches. We'll start talking about completable futures, in fact, quite a lot of things, asynchronous tasks, a lot of things, right? But the basic concept here is that you create an entirely new thread or process. In fact, the actual thing is a process. And that's why you see this guy, that's why you see this guy here, calling them processes. All of these things are threads. All of these things are threads, all of them. But these are background processes, the ones from Windows. All of these things are threads. And that's why you see Dropbox might be running like 20 threads at a time, okay? If you look at this Chrome, you see that about 10 of them are running now because there are 10 threads running, okay? So please bear that in mind. Uh, it will help you a lot to build efficient programs. There are people that build their software and it's very slow. People are shouting, why is it slow like this? Others will build a software that is also running, in fact, the codes might, might be the same thing, but the difference between this person's approach and the other person's approach is that this person handles concurrency better. This, this is where user experience comes in. When you begin to sit down and say, ah, uh, this might be a pain point for my user. This might be a pain point for my user. So let me remove this into a new thread. Let me remove this into a new thread. But you have to be careful on how you do threading. It can create memory problems for you, right? So there should be a balance to all of these things, okay? Now, you should know that the things I'm telling you here, they're out of experience, okay? Um, it's true that you can read these things up online and understand them, but uh, take my recommendations, okay? Take my recommendations. Uh, that's why it's good to, to have somebody who is guiding you. Uh, not that you cannot read and understand, but at least let someone be there that has gone through what you are about to go through to tell you, okay, take this approach, take this approach, take this approach, or help you make sense of why people do certain things that they do, right? Because I've seen code bases, I've seen how crazy some code bases can be, right? And tell you, okay, this is why these people use this approach, this is why this people use this approach, okay? So the next thing I would like us to learn today uh, would essentially be on um, files. I remember, okay, but well, before we go into files, I promised that we're going to look into uh, errors, these errors, okay? Now, let's take something very interesting. Assuming that this thing here was, I said something like, please, okay, maybe I said, enter any number, okay? Enter any numbers. Um, example, three comma four. Three comma, let me say three comma six. 
Okay, so and the idea is that when they enter the numbers, I'll add them, right? So um, and for some reason, these numbers I decided to collect them. In fact, not that I decided I collected them as a string because when people are specifying a a set of numbers, you cannot collect those numbers differently because the title of them in one line. So obviously you're going to collect this as a string. So let's say string equal to numbers, string numbers equal to um, scanner system dot in. Right, let's import this first so that we get full functionalities. Okay, so dot next line. Okay, now that we have that, we've been able to capture the numbers that the person will type. Okay, let me reduce this guy to two seconds, at least we've gotten the concept. Um, I'm not trying to make use of the thread, but I just want to show us what happens. Now, so we have captured these numbers. So I can come in here because I want to um, process this thing. So I'll say, your answer or the sum the sum of the numbers is now i'm trying to shorten things up here so let me say <clears throat> Uh, plus the numbers dot split and split it using comma and then give me the first number there. Okay. Watch what I'm doing here. Watch what I'm doing here. Then plus this. Now, if I do this, sorry, let me assess the right index one. If I do this, what I'm essentially doing is that it's going to print out 36 for me, right? Because as long as this split is still concerned, this three here is in uh, is a string and the six is a string so if we run this the output we are going to see on our screen will be 36. it will not perform a numeric function i'm building this to show us something so but let's just test what we've done so far so that you see that what it will print will be 36. but what we want it to show would be nine but let's run this let's clean and build first So let's run this and then it says enter any number so let me try 10 comma 69 so instead of printing 79 for us what this thing will print will be 1069 so you can see it's telling me that the sum of the numbers is 1069 because what it says essentially did was it splitted this two numbers based using this comma and then joined 10 and 69 together <clears throat> as a string. But what I wanted it to do was to add two of them. So uh, what I need to do at this point is to do conversion. And remember we can use uh, our integer wrapper class, integer dot pass. I've taught us this method of conversions. So we have seen it in one of our earlier classes. 
integer of pass okay i will try and understand what that warning is i'll try and understand what that warning is so integer dot pass again and then okay so what essentially oh, that error has gone now what essentially happens is that i've converted this first number to an integer i've converted this common to an integer so this plus here now will actually be doing addition no longer joining because when you when you use plus with strings it means joining but when you use plus with numbers it means addition so if i run this guy now it should now show me the sum of two numbers not the joining of two numbers that are held as strings okay let me run this to say enter any two numbers so any numbers so i'll say uh, 36 comma 34 so instead of doing 3634 it will now give me 17. so you see it's saying the sum of the numbers is 70 because of that conversion now look at this Look at this. Let's run this guy again. And then we would mistakenly type 30A, 70. Now, this is this shouldn't be a problem if we were not performing arithmetic. But let us run this and see what will happen. Enter. So can you see it has thrown up an error telling me that it cannot format that number 30a you see for input string 30a there is a number format exception it cannot format it why because even though you there's a way to convert there's a tool then your integer wrapper class to help you convert from string to numbers if there is anything that is a non-digit inside that string, a, an error will be thrown up. So, but there is a way you can handle it so that your users are not seeing things like this, right? So that your users will be seeing things that are graceful, right? Graceful, like you, you don't, if, because if you, your user is running a software and all they see is errors like this all the time, it will it will piss them off if there's if there's an alternative they will go to the alternative they want to see because they may not be able to make sense of this kind of error because they are not programmers but for you you'll be able to make sense of this kind of error what would you expect an ordinary market woman to be doing with integer number format exception like it doesn't make sense to the person and so you should be able to manage these errors in a way that makes it look graceful and let us let me show you an example how you would do that how you would do that is to come here and say please try this code for me oh sorry try this code for me oh try this code for me but i'm expecting that there might be an error if the user types the wrong thing I'm expecting a number format kind of error. So if that error ever occurs, catch that error. And this is what you're going to say to the user. Tell that user, Now, okay, so that's the error message I want the user to see. Assuming he gives us that kind of input, right? So 
let us run this and see what happens let me clean and build and then let me run this so to send tiny numbers i will say the same three and six this time around so we are supposed to get nine but this time around i'll say nine y uh, why am i typing zero i'll say nine y so and i'll press enter okay i'll explain what that e stands for i'll explain what the e stands for just a moment now so um so let me press enter and you see what will happen so you can see that this thing looks very graceful that error message that appeared in the other screen is not appearing here so what he simply said is oh, the right and the user will now know ah what did i do that this person is abusing me like this you will now see this why as a child is this why this person is causing me out like this the user will now go back and type the correct thing now because you pointed the user in the right direction i'm not saying you should be using this kind of error messages so right if you don't want to be sacked on your first day use error messages that are indicative of what the error is that you're pointing the user you can say something like ah uh, one of the numbers you entered is not valid so once that kind of uh, message is uh, the person will quickly look at the input and say oh, 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 oh so i made a mistake and so you might see error messages like this when you're interacting with software online some of them are based on this try and catch technology some of those are based on this try and catch technology all i did was to say try this code but i'm um in the event that an error like number format exception should happen then do this now um this e here like somebody was asking like what's this e for remember that whenever you have a class before something now what you've essentially created is a variable a container so this container here is what encapsulates that error so I could have decided to do something like um, I could have decided to do something like e dot get the message, get the error message, and that is what I want to print because the error is embodied in this uh, variable here. Okay, so the error would be put inside that variable. So whenever you want to know the details, you can maybe get the message or print the full error stack trace okay so let's see what this will give us instead of that our own custom message and then let's run so this time i'll deliberately make another mistake okay so you see what is saying here that i have something wrong with this input hu guys are we following yes sir the particularly yes, sir. The person that asked that question you see that the 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 system is already pointing to me that something is wrong with that my input string so i should uh, try and fix it okay so you see that a lot of people that's what they just do in fact, if you're interfacing with third party applications, okay, you were not there when they built the application and you're interfacing with it. So let's say uh, with open banking, take for instance, like what Ego BK is doing, where we interface with external banks, okay. So part of the things you would be used to when you're in interfacing with external systems is things like this e or get message. So that if an error ever occurs, since it's not a system you built, they will tell you what you're doing wrongly. And so you can use these messages to correct uh, your code or your logic. Okay. And sometimes uh, for, for those, it, you can also create an exception, right? You can also create an exception for all of those things. 
as the things you're going to see much later. Let's not go in there now so that we don't confuse us. But as you proceed, you're going to be able to create exceptions for your own projects, right? Uh, because take for instance, if you're working on a music library, okay, you can create exceptions that will tell your user that, oh, this music file you're trying to upload is corrupted. Okay, you can have those kind of extensions. You can do a lot of things, exceptions. You can do quite a lot of things. Right? Very design your custom exception. In fact, what some people do is that they even they extend they extend the, the the normal like this number format exception, right? They see that it's doing some things that they want to do, and they decide to extend it and add their own functionalities on top. And so instead of using number format exception going forward, they will now start using that their own. And in some cases, they may not even change anything inside number format exception. All they are doing is that they want to impress their bosses to make it look as if they created something new from scratch. But all they did, just remember what Goat did to animal. Goat only extended animal. But if you, let, if you remove, let me remove this through the code. So what the person will just do, it just creates another class that extends the normal format exception. And he will now be using that one. So instead of using the normal number format exception, so, so that if his superior is looking at his code, he'll be like, wow. So this guy actually created his own exception class. Wow, this guy is brilliant. This guy is good. We cannot lose somebody like this. This guy was, ah, where was he trained? They say, Ego Beke. I said, ah. I've heard about that ego They are doing very well, very well. This guy must be good. So things like that. So um, but I'm not encouraging you to go in that direction, guys. Please be, be transparent. Because the day they will bust your bubble, eh? The day they will bust your bubble, you'll not be able to explain what you are doing. Right? So please, um, it, it can sometimes be helpful if there's something, a functionality you actually want to add. But if there's no functionality you want to add, please. Don't try to mask these things, right? Because some people might see it as a way of you that you're pirating people's content and claiming them to be your own. You, you should know already know about plagiarism, right? Uh, so they see it as a criminal behavior. Okay. So please avoid it if it's not necessary. Avoid it. They say maybe you want to impress, you met, you traveled abroad for masters. I want to impress somebody you feel you want to marry, right? Uh, because you want to marry and become a citizen, maybe in that country, Canada, right? So you want to impress the person and say, ah, I'm very good with programming. I don't use, I don't use all these classes. I create my custom classes. This will be like, wow, are you that good? You say, I'm ah, very good, very good. You need to see what my exception uh, classes are doing. Let me show you a little. You now open and start doing. And within one minute, you've created an exception class. The person will be like, wow, 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 let me have your number, you know? And please don't say I'm teaching you something bad, though. I'm not teaching you something bad. I'm just telling you what is obtainable there. By the way, you did not hear it from me. You did not hear it from me. And, oh, but we are recording this. Oh, God, we are recording this. And it's even streaming publicly. Hey, whoa. Well, maybe I'll edit the recorded version and drop the one we just streamed and re-upload the edited version so that you guys will not say i taught you and then you point to this video as evidence right but you should know that you should be aware that things like this are possible right so um guys please i would like to take a 10 minutes break and then we will come back and fact, let's make it 15 minutes Right. So um, there's a question. Yeah, yeah, go ahead. Yeah, go ahead. Ask your question. Charles, um, talk now. Okay, guys. Hello, Charles. sir. Can you hear me? Is that Charles? Sir, can you hear me now? Yes, sir, it's Charles. Okay, talk, talk. I'm listening. I said I dropped the question on the uh, chat. Um, this, but I, what I said was that: What if we are trying to handle multiple errors in the try and catch? How do we catch all the different type of errors? Okay, so supposing we, there are multiple errors in the listing. Okay, so when we return from our break, or let's just do it now. 
so that I would uh, rest in the break properly. So uh, if you come into this trader, if there are multiple errors, uh, you can do what we call a multi-catch, or you have just add as many catch clauses as you want to add. So if you can do control C, you paste, do control C again, you paste. So take for instance, you can have this one as a IO, IO exception, right? And then you import the IO exception. But to tell you that IO exception is never thrown. So but let me let me uh, put something that might uh, create an IO exception. Let's say file. Uh, okay. Equal to new file. You know, IO exception means when you're dealing with input outputs. Okay. Still never thrown. I thought, have I imported file? Ah. I've imported file. So let me add, let me flesh this out since there's no constructor. Let me flesh it out. Let me say chibo dot poc right it's still never thrown uh, let us make you throw it by force okay so join dot create new file good good so we have now made this guy it can now throw because the the reason it can throw this thing is if it's trying to create this file and the file is already existing, it might create uh, through a new error or the folder where you're trying to create that new file, there's a permission restriction there. Okay, but we are going to talk about files when we come back from the break. Okay, so see what, this is a warning, not an error. It's telling me I can replace this with a multi-catch. So all I need to do, if I click on this balloon and say replace with multi-catch, it will now bring all of them in one line. So it will use the pipe operator to separate the two exceptions. That way you can have one general message on that error. But if you want specific messages, specific messages to uh, for your user, depending on the error, then you're going to leave it that way it was. You're going to leave it this way so that in here you can say uh let's say you can say something like that the error here is error one so you see in this case there is no longer advising you to use multi-catch because it has seen that the way you're handling this error here is different from the way you're handling the error here so if there are uh, unique messages you want to pass depending on what the error is then you're going to use multiple catch clauses like this. But if it's one error message, you just have a generic message. No matter what it is, just tell the user, transaction failed. Whether it's insufficient balance or whether it's that he, a, a wrong pin or whatever the thing is, you just say transaction failed. In fact, I have one app I built like that. The reason I did it that way is just, I felt like coming to specify all of these, all of these things would take me time. I just, I did a general catch multi-catch transaction failed whatever it is just know that the transaction did not go through right and so that's one way to do but if you want to uh, meticulously capture these error messages uh, distinctively then you are going to do something like this all right so um that is i believe um charles we have answered that question right yes you have all right uh, we are going to go on break. We'll come back by 2.15 and continue. But you don't need to leave the class. We'll come back by 2.15 and continue. It's just a 10 minutes break. And I'm ha I have to sound uh, uh, say it so that those who might be watching on YouTube will know that they will just skip the video for 10 minutes and come back later. All right.
Okay, um, guys, are we still here? Or we've abandoned the ship? We are still here, sir. Okay, so um, we are resuming from our break. If you look at what we uh, have on the screen, you realize we've already started talking about files. Okay, and um, this is how you create a file. Okay, so let me remove this part of the catch. Okay, let me leave it there. So this is how you create a file. And this file I'm calling it chibo.doc. Okay, I want to create a Microsoft Word file. Uh, so say this will create a new file. But that file assistance now does not have any kind of content whatsoever. So the next thing I will need to do will be to write some content into that file. So and one approach, one approach we can use is to say file writer, because this file class is something like this file class helps us manage files, right? But to write to a file and read from a file, we there are other classes we can use. But well, this guy will help us create the file, can help us delete the file, and all of that. So this file class, that's what the functionalities that are embedded in it. So take for instance, if I click on, if I do John Dot, you will see what I'm referring to. You can find out whether you can execute is an executable file, whether you can read it, whether you can write and create a new file, can delete a new file, can delete on exit. Can find out whether the file exists, find get the absolute path of the file, find out free space. But these are things, find out the last time it was modified. Now, if you look at your uh, file system, the folder structure, a lot of times you see uh, that, um, a lot of times you see that there are certain information that appear on the file system. Okay, like uh, the last time this file was modified, the, whether the file is hidden, all of those things, these are things you can use to find out uh, certain things about the file. Generally, that file class helps you manage a file. But when you want to write to a file, you can bring in your file writer. So let me call the, of the variable I'm creating writer. And then, obviously, New file writer. So, what the guy accepts, all the file writer accepts, is the file object you created. So, remember, I created chibo.doc, right, and created it as a file. After creating it as a file, I want to now write to that chibo.doc, but I cannot, you will not specify chibo.doc inside here. All you specify is a file object that is managing that chibo.org. So that's what you're going to put inside here. At this point, you can now say um, writer dot, you see it has its own functionalities. Uh, it has right, you can write a string to the file. So maybe I want to say Chibo is very handsome and soft spoken. Um, to do this may concern. These are these are actually facts, right? These are facts. I'm not making this up. Chibo is actually handsome. And it's also soft spoken. These are facts. So I'm not making it up. Mm -hmm. So if you if you think I'm making it up, 
uh, if just come around you interact with me for like one hour you realize you may not even know it you may not even realize it all this while but the moment we interact you would realize that wow i'm actually very handsome so find out for yourself okay so if i write this to that file obi what is it <laughs> so, so, no, that's am, my I, name. Sorry, no. am, I, am i not handsome no it's just one question i want to ask just one question okay i thought the, you wanted to say i'm not handsome ah no like the the variable that we are storing the file in is john right no, J -O -N. no, no, no hold on hold on hold on okay we created a file object that will help us manage chibo.doc right and so that file object is what we used in creating that chibo.doc because before now it was not existing do you understand yes no. uh, so we now say create file on that file like i used to imagine it as a file handler right so i'll now say or oh, errand boy for files okay so i'll just say errand boy please create me a new file on that name i gave you earlier okay so once that file is created you need another class entirely to write to that file but one mistake that people make sometimes is that after writing they don't close they don't close the writer and you would definitely run into a logical error your program may not run but it may not point out any syntactic error or your program may not run so it's wise to do writer dot close to show that you're done writing to that file it's wise to do writer dot close now it's going to advise us to try and do something else here but uh, for now let us leave that part out okay so let us leave that part out for now it's telling us about try with resources but let's do, let's leave that part out for now okay so okay th then there's one more thing now that we have uh written to it how do we read from it but we let's not look at that for now let us even find out whether this would actually run okay or better still better still see what we are going to do let's make this even more interesting let us print our answers let us print let's let's not talk about chibo let's print our answer directly to this file okay let's print our answer directly to this file okay so that we can now go to that file and find out whether the answer to the question we asked was actually captured there okay so let us clean and build this then we run it okay so i'll say 3600 comma 4400 so we are supposed to get 8,000 here. So enter. So as you can see, it did not show us the output here. But the idea behind this whole thing is that it was supposed to have created a file for us somewhere. OK. So let us go into our file system and inspect whether these things were created for us. So NetBeans projects, oh, it's not in there. Uh, projects, NetBeans, and then who is that guy? Threader. Okay, coming to Threader. So can we see this Chibo here? Yes. Okay, so we are going to open this Chibo file with wps and let's find out whether we are going to see uh, the answer to that question inside the file so i'll double click on chibo 
So if you look carefully here, or maybe let me zoom zoom in. If you look carefully here, you're going to see that um, we have actually created. That is, we were we successfully added the answer to the file. Okay, it looks as if some people posted questions. Let me see. Okay, can we read the file and re return specific data from it? Uh, that will be part of your assignment now. Uh, remember uh, the the math problems you were working on. Okay, you are going to this time around. A user will uh, present um, questions in a file. Then your duty will be to go and read that file, extract all those questions, calculate the answers, and then uh, return the answer in a new file entirely. Okay, so you're going to do these things yourself. It's not it's not hard, right? But we are going to look at an example here now, and so you're not doing something entirely different from what you're going to learn here in class. Okay, so now let's look at this thread again. Now that I have actually um created the fire chibo and the fire chibo is actually there for us okay let me create an entirely new file let me say chibo dot text let me use a text file okay and then once i create the file i'll write something in it uh yeah this answer and after writing it to the file after writing it to the file, I will now read from the file and put on the screen. I will now read from the file and put on the screen. I will read from the file and put on the screen. How do I do that? There are many ways to go about it. We can use the yeah, other reader, reader classes that has been implemented. But the very basic one which we are already used to is what we know as a scanner class. Now, that is why I was telling us that we are going to see where constructors are different, okay? If you look at this scanner class, equal to new scanner, right? So let us import this. Oh, have I imported scanner? Oh, I've already imported scanner. Okay, so uh, this time around, the constructor is what to be different. I will now say, uh, I will now give him this file. So this file uh, object I created here, that's what I'll su submit here. I'll say, this is the file I want you to read from. Remember that all this while, like in this case, where we used uh, system.in, we actually say read from the default system input, which is our keyboard, right? But this time around, we are saying, you're reading from this file, John. Okay, you're reading from this file, John. That's where you're taking your information from. So, in order to read from it, I can say, uh, and and be careful, be careful when you're using your scanner to read. Uh, the reason you need to be careful, in fact, not just with scanners. Anything you're not setting off, please use things like conditional statements to, or try and catch. Use try and catch to protect against uh, certain kind of errors or use conditional statements. Like, take for instance, you can do if this scanner here dot has next line. If it has next line, if it does not have, please don't do anything. But if you have, that's the only time I want you to read. And so see what I want you to do. Print so so and so to the screen for me. And what do I want you to print the screen for me? I want you to do scanner dots. Next line. Just as we would do if we we're picking it from the keyboard. Just say scanner dot next line. Okay, so but let me add some kind of something to assure us that it's actually coming from the scanner from the file. This is from the file.
Ah, this thing I just did now reminds me of something. It reminds me of something. Ah, we did not touch it. And there are there are times when you want to put in special characters into your stream. Look at what I did here. What I did here was to say, please, everything after this point, make it to appear in a new line. Right? So if I wanted to put a tab space here, I'll do backward slash then T. If it's a white space, backward slash then S. Right? So the, these things are special characters that we can insert, we can use when we are dealing with our string literals. Okay, they are very useful, very, very useful. Uh, in the fact, they are popularly known as escape sequences, right? Uh, so we can take a look at what they are, or you just read it up on your own. Uh, they are very useful things. And I'm sure you must have seen it theoretically in school. Uh, you must have come across it theoretically. So uh, let us run this and see what we are going to get. So enter any numbers. Let me say ninety comma one one zero. Enter. So if you see what it actually did, it added the two of it. Okay. Sent it uh, print answer to the file and now read the file. And the file said the sum of the numbers is two hundred. So we are going to go and look at the file system, whether there is a file called chibo.txt and confirm whether we have this exact same content there. Okay, so let's go back to our file system. Look at the threader. You see the chibo.txt file here. If you open it, you see that that's exactly what we have in there. And so that is how you uh, write to files and read from files. Okay, it is not tough. Every other thing like deleting the file and all that are things you can get from that uh, file class, which I showed you earlier. Okay. Uh, like you use this file class in managing things. Like when you create an object of it, it has a lot of functionalities. So we are not going to go into all of those details now. The important thing is that I've shown you how to create the file, write to the file, and also read from that file. These are three essential things. So when you read from a file, what you now do with what you read is now up to you. How you process what you read is up to you. So you can be creative, right? You have, like, take for instance, what uh, ChatGPT Chat does. You can just come up with a very simple program that tells people that you can create a storybook for them that they can download as print as PDF. So, and you plug in your, this is your software to chat GPT. So when people not uh, that prompt to chat GPT, then chat GPT will generate a story for you. Then you, you bring back that story, put it in a file, create that file, and then the user can now download it. Very simple business idea. And you can have, you can decide to be selling a storybook, 100 naira, 200 naira. And it could be stories that uh, maybe uh, people who want to do short plays, dramas, want to just have something to read in their spare time. And you ask them, what would you like to read about? They say something like this. Okay, fine. Just create a story for you. You create it, put it in PDF, and send it to them. They download. Very simple, straightforward. So these are things you can easily uh, have some kind of um, use cases, and you quickly and make some money off of it, okay? So uh, this should inspire you to begin to think of uh, certain things you can do, okay? So about me telling you that you can just do this, send to GPT, download, see, it's just mouth to Actual coding is much more difficult than the way I just said it. But you should understand that these things are possible, right? And these are the, are the very basics of it. These are the very, very basics of it, okay? And so it's important you uh, understand this. Okay, so uh, the other thing we are going to try and quickly achieve would be to talk about 
databases. Okay, so for that one, I would like to create a new project entirely. I would like to create a new project entirely uh, so that we can see um, our databases come alive. Okay, uh, let me, for those of you who already know databases, please uh, don't complain or don't murmur. Let us just do create a quick database so that we can uh, demonstrate what we want to learn now. Okay, I, ah, my battery is down. Okay, so but let's quickly do that so that we, we can end the class, right? So let us create a database. We you already know this from school, right? Uh, but the reason I will have to talk as I'm doing it is so that for the benefit of those who may not have come across it. So this is where I will put the name of the database. And uh, so let me say, call it DB, let me call it DB test. Apply, apply, finish. So that DB test, let me make it the default database by double clicking on it. Then I'll create a table inside it. Okay, so I'll call that table students okay so if you don't have this tool this is called my sql workbench okay uh, all you need to download is my L sql community server right my sql community server is a software that has workbench uh, the server the mysql server itself and other tools embedded in it you can install it uh, if you don't succeed at doing it because it can be challenging for some people, then you leave it when you come, or you just find a solution online, but if it's giving you troubles, when you come next week, you can show it to us, right, so that we uh, point in the right direction. So let's say we have table, so, and I make this to auto increment whenever a new record is added, and uh, the students will definitely have a name, And the students will definitely have a phone. So now, now let's 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 uh, look at a uh, fifteen, and then the name would be. 65 right and let's apply this so we now have a table in our db test database and so what we want to do now is to be able to assess this table add information in fact actually you can programmatically create your table in your database you can in fact you can even programmatically create yeah i've not tried that one before programmatically creating a database right but you can from setting you can programmatically create your because if you're doing a database if you're doing a connection from your software you need to connect to a specific database so you may not be able to create a database programmatically but you can create tables programmatically. Okay, right? So let us look at this and then we'll try to uh, connect to that guy. So we'll create a new project entirely. So we'll call this a uh, DB test. Let's leave it at DB used. It sounds like a good name. Right, so now that we have debit used, we are going to do quite some things here. Now, uh, the the things I'll be doing here would be on the assumption that we already know certain things. Uh, what I mean by that is that you already know what a method is because I want to create a method now. Now, every 
whenever you want to get something from a database, you would need to connect to that database. You would need to connect to that database first before you can begin interacting with it. So the first thing I want to do here is to create a module, a function or a method or a unit of code, a unit of my code that is dedicated to helping me connect to my database, right? Okay, so the first thing I'll do, I'll say public, and then the kind of, the kind of feedback I'm expecting from this method is actually a connection object. And I want to call this my database, go to DB. Let's call this my connection method, go to DB, right? Now, public connection, go to DB. It's now asking me, what do you mean by connection? Then I'll come in here, and it's not having the kind of connection I'm looking for. It's asking me to import from connect this type of connection, which is not what I'm looking for. The type of connection I'm looking for is actually the one that comes from this package. So imports Java, I think it's just java.sql. I'm not sure again. Java dot. Java dot util dot. No. Wait, it should be Java dot SQL. Java dot SQL dot connection. Yeah. Head beans can sometimes disappoint. Okay, so they don't even suggest it. So I have to now download it manually, uh, import it manually. So um, this is uh, java.sql connection. So I'm going into the SQL package of the Java API to get the connection object. Okay, now this is sorry, the connection class. So what I'm what I'll be returning from this method here would be the of connection type. So this connection is what I'll now be using to assess the database. But there are three, there are three key things. There are three key things. There are three key things you should note with connecting to databases. There are three parameters it usually requires. The first one would be uh, the URL. That's where can I find this database? Is it online or is in your system? Then if I find this database, what's the username to use and connect to it? Now, once you I find the right user, is there a password? Okay. So the moment I supply these three things, I should be able to uh, do this. But before we go proceed, we cannot connect to a MySQL database if we don't have the MySQL library. And that is where I was, what I was talking to us about. If there are functionalities that someone else has already implemented, then you shouldn't try to reinvent the wheel, right? Go straight, get, because it's actually possible to sit down and write a custom code that will help me assess MySQL database. But it's not a smart thing to do. A library has already been implemented that can help you do this. So the first thing we are going to do here is to register that library. Right? We're going to register that library here so that it knows specifically, specifically what you're using for your connection, specifically, because we are going to specify certain things here. So, but let's go, go uh, get that library first. You cannot always download it online. Uh, it's referred to as um, my SQL connector. Okay, it's referred to as my SQL connector. Okay, so my SQL connector for uh, Java. Okay, so if you come here, you can do your downloading, right? 
So, but I already have it in my system. So all I need to do is I'll come to this, my project. You see a libraries subfolder. You right click on that libraries. Don't click on add project or add library. Since you have already downloaded it, click on add jar. If you want to make use of the default library, because NetBeans comes with some default libraries you can use. And one of them is for my SQL databases. But don't use that one. A lot of times they are outdated. So it's better you download something recent online and then add it directly. Okay, so once I click on that, if I scroll, because I have a lot of libraries, because I use them often, you see the MySQL connector here. Once I double click on it, it will be added to my project. And so once I expand this guy here, you're going to see that my SQL connector is now active. So what I would like to do, because it will want to know where the driver class is. It will want to know where the driver class is. And so what we are going to do is, ordinarily, this is what you would have found online on their documentation, that this is where this thing is, right? But based on experience, I know where it is. So uh, it's inside uh, this package here, uh, this CJ package, right? And so this is where the driver class is. So this class is what we are going to register here. And it's not hard. All you need to do is to say a uh, class dot phone name. Then what we are going to do now is to specify that class name. And that class name is essentially com. Sorry, let me scroll up and see the name of the package. So com dot my SQL dot CJ dot JDBC, right? Then before the driver dot driver. Okay. So it's asking me that I need to, that there might be an error here. So I should either catch it or throw it. But for now, in order not to clutter, instead of using the catch clause, I'll use another alternative call to throw it. Okay. So once I've thrown that, the next thing I'll have to do here is to use this. Create a connection object and say, now, this is where, this is the reason why we had to do this. I will say, driver manager, no, driver manager, okay. Driver manager. Let me connect. Let me manually import that guy. I don't know why NetBeans is not helping me here. Uh, so let me look for yeah, this driver manager. Okay, so I'll say driver manager dot get connection. And if you look at this uh, get connection method of the driver manager class, there are three options. Either you submit just the URL, or you submit URL and a properties object, or you submit URL, user, and password. So is this third one we want to use? So, so once this is done, it also try to tell you, warn you that an error Okay, it's telling me that I've not initialized these guys. So let's go ahead and initialize them. Okay, so let's say user, no, sorry, URL first. And watch the way, this URL is very critical. Watch the way I will prep the URL. So I will say JDBC colon, because if you look at every URL, eh, you will see the protocol first. Just take a look at this guy. If you look at this URL here, you see the protocol HTTPS, then colon, 
then two forward slash. Okay, that's essentially what we are going to do here now. That's how you specify URLs. Okay, so colon, but you know, JDBC, there are various formats or variants. There are variants of the JDBC connector. Okay, and this one is specifically for MySQL. And I'll do colon again. Now, at first, you, you may not really be able to memorize this, but you should just understand that this is what is happening. And you can create this code and one time for one time use. Let's create this code, have it somewhere. So whenever you need to access your databases in a secure environment, then you can use this. If it's not a secure environment, then there are other ways to hold your password where you don't have to type it directly on the screen okay on your file so i'll say from here i'll say local host because this uh, database i want to access is on my local machine so i'll say local host and specify the port number which is port 3306 and then once that is done i can now type my database name which is db test once i have done that i have created the url <clears throat> so once once the URL has been created, the next thing will be to create the user. So user equal to, um, I think what, what, what am I using as my business? Okay, I think it's um, Abba. 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 Uh, users and privileges. Okay, so I think, yeah, I'm using root as my user. So I'm going to say that my user is a uh, root. Then the next thing will be my password. Okay, my password is Should I be communicating my password here? Uh, maybe I'll have to change it. Okay. So my password is N A N A S O. Very simple password. Okay, so that's the password I'm using. So and now you see that what we've done here is that we've specified the URL, the user, and the password, and that is what we passed in here. But the guy is still complaining. So we say we should throw for another error so I'll throw right so once that is done it still showing me an error here that if there's a missing return statement so because we said we're going to return a connection but we are not returning any connection yet so i'll say return this connection object i created here so return this connection now that we've done that we've essentially created something that will help us connect to these db tests which we created here right this db test database we can now connect to it okay but that is not the end of it you should now actually write code that will help you connect to it so but for that db test let's go and add sample information to our student table okay so that we can now fetch it from there so first of all my name is chibo and the phone number is 0816215614 right then i'll apply that apply finish okay so let me just uh, run a query just to be sure so it means it's actually the data is actually there and so we'll go back to this, our DB test application. So let's find out whether we can actually uh, run uh, this thing, okay? So now, if you look at that program we created earlier, it was asking us to use try with resources. That's whenever you have something that you need to close, like the file writer I told us we should close, 
whenever you have something like that, you know, when you close something, is when you make access to an input or output stream. You should not just leave it open like that. You need to close what you used in accessing it. So, but there's something that can help us manage this closure automatically. And that is what Java calls try with resources. We've already seen a try and catch. So, but this one is try with resources. And so how does the try with resources work? So I'll say, let me say here, try. In fact, it's actually a, a shorter way of writing something that will assess your DB. So I'll say try here. And I want it to try and get a connection first. If that connection works before it will attempt to assess my DB, if the connection does not work, then there's no need assessing my DB. There will be no need assessing my DB if that connection does not work. So I'll say, connect, then I'll call up this go to DB. Why is it not seeing my go to DB? Yeah. What happened? Let me last talk of this person. Okay. I didn't see the final. Okay, so let me see what I to see it now. Still not seeing it. Okay. Go to DB. Now go to DB. Okay, because the guy is non-static. Okay. So let us make this guy static. Right, because you cannot use non static members in a static context. I always remember that. So now that we've done that, it will want us to let me catch, let me add a catch clause. Okay, then let me make this a multi catch. Okay, now, so the, essentially what I'm saying here is please try using this method to get a connection to the DB and put it inside this connection variable. If it does not work, print this error to my screen for me. But if it works, go ahead and do whatever I have inside here. And that thing is what I want to do now. So the first thing I'll do is that I'll present, I'll prepare my query. So I'll say, my query would be, Please, one person should just tell me I'm still here. Let me let me have the courage to move on. I'm still, I'm still here. here. I'm still here. All right, thank you. So, so I'll say select all from uh, we, I call these students. Now, the reason I don't need to specify the database again is because somebody's system is on. The reason I don't need to specify that again is because I I've already specified the database name here, so I don't need to qualify this table with the database name. Okay, so I'll just say select all from students. Now that I've said select all from student, that becomes my query. But this query is just English for now, right? I need to make it an actual query. And how we do that is we make use of statements or prepared statements. There are quite a lot of options. So, but I like making use of uh, prepared statements now because it offers a lot of flexibilities. Okay, so I'll say prepare statement is, is a class in still the Java SQL uh, package. Okay, so prepare statement. So let me try prepare statement. This. Okay, so let me try and import it. Whether NetBeans will help me this time. NetBeans is still not help, helping matters. Okay, so let me go ahead and manually import this. But it is there, it is there in the Java 
uh, API. But I don't know why it isn't, you know, picking it up. So I'm importing that manually. So prepare statements, statements. So equal to this connection. Now this connection to the DB. Use that connection to prepare this to an act, make it an actual statement. Okay, make this query an actual statement that I can execute uh, on my database. Okay, so now that I've made that uh, query an actual statement that can be executed, the next thing I'll do is I'll create a result object that can help me hold all the results that will come out from my database. So I'll say resource sets, and I still need to import resource sets. Without that, we are not going to make progress. So let me import resource sets. Okay, so resource sets RS equal to um, statements, these statements that I just prepared execute the query for me. So now that I've done statement that is a query, they, it will bring out all the students and put in that result object. So this result object will have all results from that database. So it, it doesn't end by just fetching the results. You need to actually make use of that result. So I can say something like if this result has anything inside it at all, what you should do, so how do I check whether it has a result? So I'll just say if results dot next. That means if the, if it returns as true, it means it actually fetched something. If it returns at false, it means it never fetched anything, right? So I'll say um, system dot out dot prints line right so what are my prints i just want the student's uh, name printed to the screen so i'll just say my name is then that result set object i'll get it and say please get me a string inside you that string is called name right? because if you look at this database here i call this guy name so i'm saying to it essentially please get me a string inside this result object here get me a string called name so when you get me that string please concatenate it with this uh, thing here and print it to the screen so let us run this db test so I'm suspecting I might have an error thrown here, um, but let us see, let us see. Because um, it's been long I wrote, it's been long I wrote this database connection method. Oh, let's see. Because I just, what I remember is just the pattern of what it looks like, but let us, let us run it. It should be fine. So I'll clean and build. Then I will run it. Okay, so there is a problem. It's telling me that uh, the server time zone where Central Africa is unrecognized or represents more than one time zone. Okay, okay. Okay, so what I'm supposed to do there, I was, I'm supposed to, uh, I'm supposed to add a server time zone listing. Uh, okay, okay, okay. 
right? And there is something I should be able to use and do that. Um, something I should be able to use and do that. It should be. I should do question mark here and say time zone. Uh, Africa slash Lagos. Let's run that again. Um, I'm, I'm not certain I used the right word, but let's try that again. <clears throat> Clean and build. Okay. Okay, it's server time zone. Okay, so that's not what I should use. I shouldn't use the word time zone. There's something else I should use. Uh, at this point, I will have to look at my old code. Yeah, let me think I did something like that on Gen set. Guys, just one moment. Let me see how to qualify that guy. Uh, okay. Oh, the right word there is server time zone. Right, these things would be available in the documentation. Okay, so the right thing there is server time zone. That's what to use. Okay, so I just typed time zone. So server time zone should be Africa stroke Lagos. Okay, and because it read the system time and it saw West Africa there, so it wasn't comfortable with it. He wanted something more specific. If you look here, it says West Central Africa, which covers a lot of countries. Okay, so he wanted something very specific. Okay, so but let's now that we've changed that, let's run this again and see what happens. Okay, so run this. Okay, so if you look very well, you see that it actually displayed my name correctly. So if I go back to the DB and change this my name value uh, and make it Chibo Samuel, right? Then apply that update to the database. If I come back and rerun this project, you see that the new thing will also be the updated database version or uh, content, right? So guys, that is how you do, you assess content from your database. Um, I'll upload, I'll zip up and upload the codes we've done today to the announcements. Um, so, uh, but for now, no room for questions. We've exceeded our time already. So please, any questions, just drop it in the community and we'll take it up from there. Bye, guys. Goodbye, sir. Thank you, sir. Oh, my boy. Ubi, you don't read. Oh, Come down this class. Let's do the recording.